Welcome to Mongolia. Much of Mongolia is rolling plains, short grass plains, or desert, spiked by mountains. This land is well suited for raising livestock, but not terribly well suited for farming. So of course what folks do here is to raise cattle and sheep and goats. Although there may look like there's plenty of grass out there, it tends to be short and a little bit thin so that the herds have to be moved from time to time to get to better grass. Now with the uh, herds of sheep and goats, some cultures depend pretty heavily on dogs to keep them under control. But in Mongolia, uh, apparently the way that uh, one herds sheep and goats is by uh, horseback. One thing about the horseman in this pony, uh, and it is a small horse, uh, is that uh, he's got this long pole with a rope at the end of it, and that takes the place of the cowboy's lariat. Notice also when he rides on this horse, he's going to be standing up in the stirrups, not sitting in the saddle. The result is that you tend to have the same kind of cowboy culture in Mongolia that you have in the American West. And one of the things that cowboys do is to sing to their uh, livestock at night. Mongolians developed a peculiar kind of singing called throat singing in which uh, a single singer can produce as many as three different sounds out of his mouth at the same time. There's also a type of singing that sounds remarkably like the singing of North American Indians. Uh, here at the Nadam Festival opening, uh, you can hear that kind of music. Much of Asian history can be interpreted as a conflict between the culture of the ranchers, represented here by the Mongols, and the culture of Chinese farmers. The peak of that conflict came during the period of the Mongol Empire, uh, represented by uh, Genghis Khan and his period. Genghis Khan as a title means something like universal ruler, but the man's name was Temujin. 
Temujin's rise to power is not particularly well documented. There are, as a result, a couple of Hollywood movies which have come out to try to fill in that gap with some fanciful uh, thoughts. I, Temujin, chief of all Mongols, and henceforth ruler over the possessions of Wang Khan, make known to all men present and afar off. A primary source is the secret history of the Mongols, which was discovered by Palladius, a Russian, in Peking at about 1900. It's believed to have been written about 1228 and probably commissioned by the royal family itself. It's probably better called a private history of the Mongols because it was intended for use by the imperial family to educate their children. In many ways, the Mongol army was not unusually well equipped to take on the entire world. The type of armor that they were using, for example, tended to be leather and mail armor, which had been in use in Europe for many years. These boots show scale armor, though, which I've never seen in a boot. The Mongols did have one super weapon, which they shot from horseback, and that was the short compound bow. This bow is largely made of horn and sinew, and the result is that it has a tremendous drawing power and striking power. This display in the Ulaanbaatar uh, History Museum also suggests that the, uh, uh, that the arrows were uh, tipped with poison, which is something that I hadn't heard before. After unifying the Mongols, Genghis Khan struck first to the east and then to the west in order to expand his empire. In the meantime, we shall move westward. With China safely in the hands of Jebai, Subodai will move north into Russia, while Kassa drives south to bring India to her knees. Jehovah. In the next few years, the Mongol hordes of Genghis Khan seized all of China north of the Yellow River carved its way across the Ural Mountains into Russia and plunged southward across the borders of India. Having conquered almost all of Asia, Temujin turned his armies towards Samarkand and Bukhara. Before we move on from Genghis Khan, I'd like to bring up something that a Persian uh, court chronicler who happened to be Jewish, Rashid Adin, said. Uh, and that is that uh, Genghis Khan's clan uh, was noted for being red-haired and green-eyed. One of the reasons that uh, the first son of Genghis Khan was believed not to have been legitimate was because he didn't have red hair, and there was a dispute between the number one and the number two son over succession, which is why the number three son, Ogadai, becomes Khan. Genghis Khan was also surprised that his grandson, Kublai Khan, had dark hair and not red hair. Now, in addition to what Rashid tells us, we also know from Marco Polo that Kublai Khan did have dark hair, but Marco Polo remarks that Kublai Khan was unusually light-complected, and he had a slight reddish tint in his complexion. Welcome to Karakoram, the capital of the uh, Khan's empire. Frankly, Karakoram was uh, never very much. The missionary William of uh, Rubruk, uh, 13th century, dismissed the city as being no bigger than a suburb of St. Denis in Paris. Uh, then there was uh, Giovanni di Planio uh, Carpini, um, also about the same period of time. He sent an envoy to the Mongols in 1245 by Pope Innocent IV, and he described the city vaguely as at the distance of a year's walk from Rome. The city never had much time to expand. It was really only the active capital for 40 years before Kublai Khan moved it to Beijing. When Ogadai was in town, he used to sit at the palace. A team of German archaeologists recently uncovered the foundations of the palace close to the stone turtle. This is a stone turtle. I don't know what the story is about the stone turtle, but it's probably the biggest landmark left in Korakorum. 
not very far from it, though there's a pile of rocks. Now that signifies that it's some kind of a sacred site. You're supposed to leave something there, and most people leave a rock. Next door to it are the ruins. The Mongols were known for their religious tolerance, and they split their time equally among all the religions, so that there are 12 different religions here in town, including Nestorian Christians. As a matter of fact, even Ogadai's wife and Kublai's mother were Nestorian Christians. But the most memorable part of the city has got to be a fountain that was designed in 1253 by a French jeweler and sculptor, Guillaume Boucher, or Bouchy, of Paris, who had been captured by the Mongols in Hungary and brought back to embellish Karakorum. The fountain was in the shape of a huge silver tree, which simultaneously dis uh, dispensed mare's milk from silver lion heads, wine, rice wine, uh, mead, uh, from four uh, golden spigots shaped like snakes' heads. On top of the tree there was an angel. Rubric says that uh, they had wild feasts here, in which the Mongol guests guzzled 105 cartloads of alcohol. There are also uh, quarters for artisans here, uh, and it was populated largely by people who were frankly not uh, Mongol and who had been brought back uh, to Karakorum from all over Asia in order to enhance the empire. If you want to see the construction of Korokorum these days, you have to go over to the local monastery because the local monastery was built out of the bricks from Korokorum, and so those bricks date back to the Khan's imperial city. Kublai Khan moved the capital to Beijing and established a summer palace called Xanadu. In the 17th century, uh, there was sort of a, a mobile capital of Mongolia. It made some 25 moves that we know of over the course of about a century or so. In 1706, the name of the capital was Kuri, which just means camp. Um, but by 1778, Korea uh, was erected basically uh, where, it, uh, where it is today, that is at Ulaanbaatar. Then it was called the City of Felt. Later, it was just the Great Camp. In 1911, Mongolia was first proclaimed independent from China, and the city became the capital of what was then called Outer Mongolia. In 1918, uh, it was invaded by the Chinese, and then three years later by the Russians. There was a renegade white Russian officer who thought he was the reincarnation of Genghis Khan and he was going to restore the Mongol warlord's previous empire. His uh, name was Baron Roman Nicholas Fyodorovich von Ungersteinberg. He was nicknamed the Mad Baron. Uh, it said that he could have a psychotic stare that fixed uh, on people like those of a wild animal in a cave. Uh, he spoke in a high-pitched voice, and his bulging forehead bore a huge sword scar, which pulsed with red veins whenever he grew agitated. As a finishing touch, one of his eyes was slightly larger than the other. He was uh, backed in part by the Japanese, but of course the Bolsheviks caught up with him and executed him. In any event, that brings us up to uh, where we are with the Mongolian version of Red Square in front of us. The name of the capital is now Ulaanbaatar, uh, which means Red Hero. The country was now under Russian control, and the Soviets came in and destroyed much of the old architecture, including the old Tsarist buildings. They shut down the monasteries, except for a few that they kept as museums. In 1990, the country went uh, democratic, but the Communist Party retained its control of the country, uh, changing its name to the Revolutionary Party. When I landed in Ulaanbaatar, there had recently been elections, which the Democrats thought that they ought to have won. Nonetheless, the ruling party declared the election results in its favor. The result was a riot in this particular area. This is uh, Mongolia's version of Red Square. And most of the public buildings are not very far away. And fires were set and people were killed. 
This is the Revolutionary Party's headquarters. It was the primary target of uh, the people that were rioting, and as you can see, it's been thoroughly trashed and thoroughly burned. Some of the fires got out of control, and it's said that some museum artifacts had been damaged. The next building over that you can see is the Ulaanbaatar Hotel, where I had reservations. We're in the Ulaanbaatar Hotel. This was built in uh, Soviet times, and uh, back in those days, all the uh, Russian officials that came in here uh, to Ulaanbaatar stayed at this hotel. It's the finest hotel in town. I'm going to give you a short tour of the public areas of the hotel. Uh, the hotel, as I said, was built in uh, communist times, in, in Soviet times, and it was built primarily for Soviet officials. And that's why it's right next to the Revolutionary Party headquarters, uh, because uh, the Soviet officials would be able to just go out the front door and right over to the Mongolian Communist Party uh, building and discuss uh, events with their counterparts. I wonder if they pulled out the microphones yet. Here we are at the Nadam Festival. The Nadam Festival is an Independence Day celebration and it occurs all over the country. And we're at one of the regional ones down in the Gobi Desert. While you're watching the festival, I'm going to recount a little bit of history. While Genghis Khan's greatest disappointment in life may very well have been the quality of his sons, his greatest pride must have been in his daughters. He left a large sections of his empire to the control of his daughters, although they gradually lost power to the sons. Mongol women presented a strange sight to civilizations uh, they helped conquer. They rode horses, shot arrows uh, from their bows, and they commanded men and women around them. In China, the Mongol women rejected foot binding, and in the Muslim world, they refused to wear the veil. At Ogadai's death, his wife assumed uh, complete power, and she replaced the ministers with her own, the most important of which was a woman named Fatima, a Persian captive from the Middle Eastern campaigns. She eventually passed her power on to her son, but he died within 18 months, and he was replaced by his widow. When Kublai Khan ruled China, his cousin Kaidu continued to fight against him from Central Asia, and true to Mongol tradition, Kaidu's daughter fought with him. According to Marco Polo, she was both beautiful and powerful. She defeated so many men in wrestling that today, Mongol wrestlers dress wearing an open vest in order to visibly distinguish the male from the female wrestlers. As the Mongol Empire crumbled, the men returned to squabbling over sheep and stealing horses, but the women tended to keep the imperial spirit alive. In the late 15th century, a new conqueror arose, determined to restore the empire. Known to the Mongols as Manduai the Wise, she took the battlefield and united the scattered tribes into a single nation. She fought even while she was pregnant and once injured while carrying twins. She and the twins survived and her army won the battle. Mandue left behind seven sons and three daughters, but the era of the great warrior queens of Mongolia had passed. Uh, so much now for history. Let's get back to the wrestling match here. What we have in the match is a series of uh, single uh, competitions between uh, two individuals. When one individual is thrown to the ground, he loses. The other has a uh, cap put on his head and is declared the winner, and he does what's called the eagle dance, which you see here. It's uh, probably as much posturing as you're going to see anywhere. From that point, he proceeds over to the judge's bench where he uh, receives all the uh, rewards that are due to the winner, uh, which includes a, a bowl of fermented mare's milk. Uh, I've had fermented mare's milk. It's, uh, it's a thin uh, milk. It's, it's sweet. Uh, and it has about as uh, much alcohol in it uh, as beer.
Of course, the winner of the competition is not the only person enjoying the fermented mare's milk. Uh, people get it in the stands as well. Wrestling is only one of the three manly sports. Uh, the others uh, include horse racing. Uh, here we see uh, some winners coming in. Uh, the first five horses to uh, return are actually declared the winners, not just the first one. The jockeys may be as young as nine years old, and they may be either male or female. Something, though, that is quite different is that these uh, competitions are set up according to the age of the horse. Uh, the horses run as, as young as yearlings, and the older the horse is, the longer the distance it's going to be running with uh, its uh, similar group of, of horses. Those horse races may go on for the oldest horses as long as 30 kilometers. That's about 20 miles. Did you notice that one of the horses came in without a jockey? Uh, the jockey was uh, lost uh, several kilometers ago, but the horse came in anyway. At one point it was leading the pack, but when it crossed the finish line it came in number two. Now, a horse that comes in without a jockey is not disqualified. Uh, it's still a winner. The only thing that happens is it's placed back one place. So because it came in in second place, it would be given a third place finish. Winning horses are given a blue ribbon, not like they are in many places, except this is a really big blue ribbon. Uh, in addition, they're going to be uh, uh, curried down and taken care of uh, immediately after the race. This horse is being filmed for local TV broadcast. Here's something you don't see in the United States. This horse's tail uh, was tied for the race. Apparently uh, the Mongols believe that the horse is going to run better if the tail is not flopping in every direction. On the final day, all of the horses that were winners from all of the races get together at the arena for the presentation of, of their awards and for their award ceremony. The third of the manly sports is archery. Uh, here we're stringing a bow, uh, breaking it across the, the knee to bring the string up. The power on the men's bow is about 70 pounds. Those people downrange are the man's competitors and uh, they're going to be uh, picking up the uh, arrows and uh, fixing up the, the targets when they're, when they're hit. But no one seems to be uh, concerned about the people downrange being hit. When Europeans shoot arrows, uh, they shoot uh, holding the string with two fingers. But you'll notice here that the Mongols are not using their fingers to hold the string. Instead, they've been using their thumbs. Like with horseback racing, uh, there's no problem with women or even uh, children competing on the archery event. This has to be the smallest female archer that I saw on that day at Nadam. We're going to be moving now from the Nadam Festival uh, to Roy Chapman Andrews and the 1920s expedition uh, which he led for the American uh, Natural History Museum into the Gobi Desert. His most important paleontological uh, discoveries were south of Ulaanbaatar at a place called the Flaming Cliffs. Andrews wrote of a majestic canyon that seemed to shout tongues of fire in the evening light. The locals call this Bayan Zach, which means rich in Zach. Zach is that little uh, tree that you see over there, and it makes really good firewood, burns a long time. 
Roy Chapman Andrews came here and he renamed this The Flaming Cliffs. Roy Chapman Andrews had a great flair for the dramatic. When I was a little boy, I read about this place. Roy Chapman Andrews was a hero of mine because I really loved dinosaurs. I used to have a little book uh, that I remember. It was called The Real Book of Dinosaurs. And in that, it introduced me to Roy Chapman Andrews and the fact that he found the dinosaur eggs. Roy Chapman Andrews got out of college and he immediately went to work for the American Natural History Museum in New York. There he was primarily used as a taxidermist. They started sending him out on expeditions though to collect specimens and during World War I he was in the Navy in naval intelligence specializing in Asia. He didn't come out here looking for dinosaurs. In fact his expedition was supposed to be looking for the missing link. There's nothing out here today. There's no museum. There's no dig going on. We're out here just to see what he saw and the terrain that he saw. And there are still fossils being washed out here. There are fresh ones all the time. Something to keep in mind is that these were wild and lawless times in Mongolia with revolutions all around the country. Roy Chapman Andrews was not a paleontologist. In fact, he wasn't really much of uh, anything. He worked for the museum, the American Museum of Natural History. And he was the leader of the expedition, but he had no scientific background. And what they were looking for was not dinosaurs, it was not dinosaur eggs. Back in the 1920s, they were looking for the missing link. Now the reason they thought the missing link might be here is because they had found some skeletons of Peking men not too far away from here, about 300,000 years old. And they thought perhaps the missing link between apes and humans was someplace in this neighborhood. There was a theory that uh, the animals, the mammals, had all dispersed, evolved and dispersed out of Central Asia. It was very popular at the time and they figured that if all the other mammals had, people had too. Roy had divided up his team into two segments, a, a camel caravan that ran the supplies up to the group, and the other one was a set of Dodge cars and trucks which ran throughout the desert uh, looking for what it was that they were searching for. Now one time Roy was pretty much separated from most of the rest of his party. He was out in a vehicle by himself and uh, he happened to notice some uh, men approaching on horses with uh, with rifles. Now the only people that had rifles out here were bandits and so not knowing what else to do he hit the accelerator, charged them, firing wildly in every direction, scaring their horses and the bandits away. While this approach was successful, at least in this particular case, it does make you wonder. I wonder if those really were bandits. The expedition began to find a lot of protoceratops uh, fossils. Notice how similar these are to the griffin. It's possible that this is the origin of that animal. It's a specimen of protoceratops. This dinosaur was first discovered by Andrew's team in the 1920s. They named it Protoceratops andrewsi, Andrew's first horn. But of course, it's the dinosaur eggs that had everybody excited. And the fact of the matter is that the paleontologist that was working on the expedition uh, just about fell down the cliff uh, and accidentally ran into the, the eggs for the first time. The expedition had found so many protoceratops that it pretty quickly leaped to the conclusion that these eggs were the eggs of a protoceratops. That turns out to not always be the case. In uh, one situation uh, they found a dinosaur uh, close by the nest but it wasn't a protoceratops and so the expedition came to the conclusion that this dinosaur was attempting to rob the nest of a protoceratops and so they called the animal Oviraptor, uh, egg thief. It now turns out that the eggs were not those of a protoceratops, they were instead uh, those of the Oviraptor, the 
animal that they thought was trying to rob the nest. Actually, it turns out to have been it was the mother uh, of the uh, of the nest trying to protect her own eggs. Roy Chapman Andrews was a great promoter and after a period of time he got himself promoted into the position of director of the American Museum. But that job unfortunately did not last long. A lot of people say that Indiana Jones was patterned after Roy Chapman Andrews and that might be true. There's one thing that everybody knows about Indiana Jones and that is he's afraid of snakes. Roy Chapman Andrews also was terribly afraid of snakes. One time he camped out into the Gobi and for some reason vipers started coming into the camp, coming into the tents at night. And uh, everybody was staying up all night trying to keep the vipers out. In addition to dinosaurs, Roy's expedition also found the fossils of the world's largest land mammal, the Andricotherium. Out of the darkness emerges a 12-ton giant. A fully grown male stands over 7 meters tall and weighs in at 15 tons. That's equivalent to 8 modern rhinos. No other land animal even comes close. The violence of the Soviet and uh, Chinese revolutions eventually made it impossible for Roy Chapman Andrews to continue making his expeditions. Plus, there was the Great Depression that came along and uh, the money for these kind of expeditions quickly dried up. But with the return of democracy in Mongolia and uh, a certain amount of uh, stability in the country, a number of museums have started coming back, including the American Museum. The exhibit that you're looking at it was recently discovered. It's a velociraptor made famous by Jurassic Park that's locked in a battle with a protoceratops, the kind of dinosaur that uh, Roy Chapman Andrews had, was discovering so many of. The protoceratops has the arm of the velociraptor locked in its jaws and that's how they died. Remember the raptors from Jurassic Park? They were much bigger than this velociraptor you see, a skeleton of. Jack Horner was the paleontologist advising Jurassic Park and he knew that their raptors were much too large. Well, that's at least to be uh, velociraptors anyway. But before the movie was released, paleontologists discovered Utah raptor, which is roughly the same size as the raptors in Jurassic Park. By the way, uh, scientists speculate that both dinosaurs were killed when a sand dune collapsed on them, and that's why the skeletons were found intact. These are protoceratops nestlings. Obviously, these were killed by some natural event, all at the same time so that they were found in the same nest. The large skeleton in this room is a tabasar. The tabasar is very closely related to Tyrannosaurus rex, as a matter of fact, it's normally considered to be within the Tyrannosaur family. 
One of the reasons for that is because of something unusual about Tyrannosaurus rex. It only has two fingers. The Taubasar, notice, also only has two fingers on each hand. By the way, when I was at the Flaming Cliffs, I ran into two huge owls. Uh, they had a wingspan of about five feet across, and their nests, so you can see one of them here, uh, looked kind of like uh, eagles' nests. Not we found bad. actually two of those nests, and we found uh, debris of hedgehogs. We believe that the owls had been eating the hedgehogs. Well, it's the end of my day at the Claiming Cliffs. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, end my conversation about Roy Chapman Andrews and dinosaurs and such. But what I would like to do now is I'd like to turn and talk to you about some of the animals that are currently living in the Gobi and, and which I ran into. Those two really big owls that I ran into were probably long-eared owls. They're the largest owls, I think, in the neighborhood. But they're not the only ones. Uh, this is a teeny little owl, a little burrowing owl, and it is officially called the Little Owl. I thought this guy was about as cute as a button, and he was very uh, uh, accommodating by letting me uh, stay and uh, watch him for about as long as I, I wanted to do that. This wasn't the only little owl that I saw. I saw another one inside a monastery. He was living kind of like a barn owl up in the, up in the rafters above the monks who were practicing their chants. So my youngest student is 10 years old. And all in Mongolia, there are a couple of ways about getting around. One is to jump on a Mongolian pony. But out here in the desert, it makes more sense, I think, to get on a Bactrian camel. Most of the Gobi isn't covered by dunes like these, but as we focus in on the top of the dune, notice that the sand is moving. This sand dune is moving toward us. For this sort of terrain, camels must surely be the best transportation. Hey. <laughs> What animal do you think made these tracks in the dune? It's this little black beetle, but they look so strange, so different, that you wouldn't have guessed it, or at least I wouldn't have guessed it was a little black beetle. Only a few miles away, there's a place called Yol Valley. Yol means vulture. And in this particular case, what's really interesting is that this valley is filled with ice as late as late July. And uh, currently, uh, at the moment these photos were being taken, it was early July and there was quite a bit of ice left. In the winter, the ice builds up here very thick, as much as 30 feet thick. And the reason it doesn't melt much during the summer, of course, is because it is in a valley, and early in the morning and late in the afternoon, the sun cannot get to the ice.
Getting into this icy little valley proves a lot easier than getting out did. This is one of the commonest little animals that I saw. There must have been uh, dozens of them that I saw on the trip in various places. And uh, for the most part, they move very rapidly uh, for a few feet, and then they stop. And when they stop, they tend to be very photogenic. They seem to be, once they get used to you, quite willing to have their pictures taken. When I first saw it, I thought that it was a scorpion. Uh, because of the way that it moved and the way that its tail was held, like it is here in this particular clip. One morning when it was quite cold and the lizards were rather sluggish, I was able to catch one. And this will show you just how big this monster is. He's a teeny tiny little lizard, only about four inches long, and that includes the tail. He got so comfortable in my hand, I think he was getting warm, that he didn't want to leave. And so when I opened his ham he hand, he didn't jump out like I expected him to. And even when I lowered him all the way down to the ground, it took him a little while to decide that he wanted to leave. During bad weather, these little lizards tend to live in uh, burrows that can be about three feet underground. The males are uh, territorial, uh, and the, uh, the females produce two clutches in a year uh, up to about four eggs apiece, depending on the food supply and the rainfall. These things are said to be the uh, primary prey of the Gobi steppe eagle, uh, but I would think that it would take a bunch of them to make a meal. Uh, more likely, owls and smaller birds probably uh, take these things pretty often. This next little rodent is a pika. It's about the size of a guinea pig or perhaps a, a very small uh, groundhog. And I would think that uh, steppe eagles would be more interested in something about this size or a little bit bigger. I would expect that the one that you're looking at is a female uh, gathering materials for a nest. These video shots were taken in the old valley and Normally these things move so rapidly that you really can't get a bead on them with the camera and get any kind of good shots. But this was in along a trail and I figured that there are so many people that come down this trail so often uh, that these little pikas are pretty much used to people by now. We're moving on to some night shots that I took. Uh, I had asked the, uh, the driver uh, to stop when he saw uh, a little hopping uh, rodent that I had uh, seen and uh, that's what he's done here and I've gotten out of the vehicle and I'm walking forward to see if I can possibly identify just exactly what it is. This is quite possibly the most unusual video footage that I got on the trip. This is a long-eared Jeroboa. Uh, now they tend to stay in sand-filled valleys with uh, some low brush around them, semi-desert areas. And they're found in places where uh, the plateau is cold and high as it is here. The long-eared Jeroboa is layered with uh, short hair and its upper parts uh, have a combination of kind of red and yellow with the belly being kind of white while the feet tend to be covered with little bristly hairs. These are small jumping rodents. In Australia you'd call them kangaroo rats. But here they're Jeroboas, and the long-eared Jeroboa can be distinguished from other Jeroboas by the enormous ears, which are about a third larger than its head. Now very little is known about this species. Other Jeroboas are presumed to be primarily nocturnal. Uh, we assume that this one is as well. During the day they tend to stay in underground burrows, which they dig themselves. Little owls are probably one of the most common predators of these Jeroboas. There's one thing you might find interesting. Uh, those large ears may help it to, to locate flying insects. Uh, the Jeroboas, uh, the long-eared ones at least, are capable of eating flying insects. Uh, the long-eared Jeroboa can hear uh, the insect and then jump up quickly and catch the prey while it's flying.
those uh, long ears also suggest something else, and that is that these long-eared Jeroboas are probably communicating with each other uh, using sound. Another way of communicating probably is just the same way that their uh, relatives do, and that is by engaging in something called dust bathing. Uh, there's a kind of a chemical uh, communication um, in the dust bath. This next animal is the ibex. It's a kind of uh, mountain goat. And uh, this one uh, is coming out of a cave where it had been uh, staying during the day. It's uh, getting to be uh, evening. The sun is going down. And we're very close to a watering hole. And, and that's why we stopped at this particular case, because we assumed that the goats would be coming out here. Uh, the males can uh, grow large, slightly curved horns. So they can exceed about 24, 25 inches in length in the older animals anyway. Special hooves make them uh, excellent climbers. The, they can frequently uh, go up uh, very precipitous uh, cliff areas. They have a brown coat and a distinctive beard uh, and a silvery back. They tend to feed on grasses, shrub, and, and lichen. This is a ground squirrel in the uh, Yole Valley, uh, very close to uh, where we, we found the uh, pica that we photographed. But there is a difference between this and the pica, and that is the ground squirrel uh, does have a much more substantial tail. It's also slightly smaller. Uh, but otherwise, there are a number of similarities. This ground squirrel, uh, well, you can think of that as a prairie dog, if you like. This next animal, the locals refer to as Taki, but uh, you may know it better as Przewalski's horse. This animal was found uh, throughout uh, Mongolia at one time, but the last sightings of it in the wild had been about 1969 or so. Since then, it was declared extinct in Mongolia. All was not lost, though, because uh, there were a number of uh, Taki or Przewalski horses uh, in zoos, especially in Europe. Gradually, the intent formed in Europe to reintroduce these horses into Mongolia. The first time I saw the Przewalski's horses, uh, they were uh, shown under the name of Urferda, that is, original horse. That was at the Sauberberg in Germany about 34 years ago. Conservationists didn't do so well uh, working with the communist government. But then when democracy uh, hit Mongolia back in the 1990s, uh, the environment changed quite a bit. By that time, the worldwide population of Taki had hit about 1,500. They were scattered around zoos in Australia, Germany, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. Between 1992 and 2004, the Przewalski horses were reintroduced into Mongolia at a national park. Today, there are something more than 200 horses in the national park. Given the uh, general political and logistical uh, restrictions, this has generally been considered to be miraculous. The name Przewalski's horse, as opposed to Taki, comes after a, a, a Polish explorer who, who first discovered the uh, horses in uh, about 1878. Uh, I think he may have also been a Russian general of some kind. In any event, now all of the Taki or Przewalski's horses are descended from a bloodline of just three stallions. And the result is there have to be computerized bloodlines established. These are the last truly wild horses uh, left. These are the forerunners of the domestic horse, and these are the ones that you generally see depicted in cave paintings in France. Uh, these horses used to roam around all over uh, Europe as well as Asia. These are not just horses that have been allowed to become feral. This is a separate breed. Domestic horses have 64 chromosomes, whereas the Przewalski's horse has 66. Notice the dark stripe down the back. And if you focus on the legs, you can see that there's a kind of striping that reminds you of the stripes on a zebra. Przewalski's horse can crossbreed with a domestic horse, and it produces a, a crossbreed that is a fertile offspring, unlike a mule. But this fertile offspring possesses 65 chromosomes, 
unlike either the Przewalski's horse or the domestic horse. Now this brings up a problem. In with the Przewalski's horses, I've seen Mongolian ponies, domestic horses, and the result is that they are almost certainly inbreeding. That inbreeding could threaten the future of the Przewalski's horse in Mongolia. Today the world population of Przewalski's horses is about 1,500. About 250 live in the wild. The absolute first European to report seeing these horses was Johann Schlittberger, who was uh, on a trip to Mongolia as a prisoner of the Mongol Khan back in the 15th century. This animal very nearly died out in 1945 because uh, there were only two zoos that held them, Munich and uh, Prague. This animal is a marmot. It's a ground bur burrowing rodent about halfway between the size of a groundhog and a beaver. When it sees a predator, it tends to take up this position. Uh, it's looking to, uh, to see what we're doing and whether or not it ought to run. Frankly, in the case of most of the Mongolian locals anyway, it ought to run. And the reason is because this thing is on the menu. If you want authentic Mongolian barbecue, this is it. And uh, what you're looking for is what in English we call blowtorched marmot. Yes, indeed. The first thing that you do is you pull out the innards, and then the carcass is stuffed full of scalding rocks. Next, the uh, neck is cinched up with wire. The bloated animal is then thrown on the fire, or uh, blowtorched, uh, to burn the fur off the outside while the meat is cooked from within. The finished product vaguely resembles a balloon with paws. Like most things involving a blowtorch, this is uh, true man's work. Uh, incidentally, uh, this animal may be responsible for the bubonic plague, or Black Death, that covered Europe. I found this pastoral scene of uh, uh, goats and sheep at uh, sunset to be irresistible, and I started uh, filming it. Uh, however, I was fairly close to the uh, gear, the yurt, uh, as they say in Russian, and uh, the family dogs uh, thought that I was getting a little too close. Mongolian dogs can be very aggressive, but I held my ground. The Lonely Planet Travel Guide has ten survival phrases. The first one is, hold your dog in Mongolia. But of course, I couldn't remember it when I needed it. When I didn't back off or a turn, the dogs lost their courage. But the fact of the matter is, there's some really good stories about wild dogs in Mongolia and the Gobi Desert. Turns out that Roy Chapman Andrews and his wife were nearly attacked by wild dogs at, at night in the Gobi while they were sleeping. Uh, fortunately, they woke up in time, saw, saw the dogs, and uh, they shot one of them, and that drove the, the rest of them off. Maybe they could have just glowered at them like I did. But in any event, that brings us to the end.